on the world for Christ. Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We sing together our opening song. have the privilege of proclaiming together in the house of the Lord this faith that makes us brothers and sisters in Christ. This faith in this God, Father who created us, Son who redeemed us, and this Holy Spirit who gets us in on, counsels us, grows us, and keeps us in this one true faith that makes us partners in the gospel. We rehearse in here what we believe so that we can shout it with gentleness and respect out in the world. And so we proclaim together with boldness and courage what we believe about our God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Would all the children please come forward for the children's message?
this morning, it's really important that you can see what I have in my hand. So kind of like scooch in this way and kind of come around so you can see what I have in my hand because it's, it's kind of important. I know some of you have seen one of these things before, um, but uh, I'm just going to tell you what it is. There's five metal balls, right? And when you take one of them and let it go, it's going to not work that great, but we'll do it anyway. It'll go, and all of them end up moving just a little bit. And it keeps going and going and going. And then if we had it, like, on a desk, it would keep going for a really long time. And if you took all the air out of the room, this would actually go, like, forever. Kind of cool, huh? So, again, you'd take one. And then they all start moving, and then they move back and forth and back and forth, and it keeps going. So here's what I want to talk to you about today. Um, I want to talk to you about how the love of Jesus works with his people, okay? So we're going to stop this and put this over here. So I want to talk to you about the way the love of Jesus works with people. There's a Bible verse that we heard last week that we're still kind of talking about a little bit today. And it says this. It says, the love of Jesus compels us. What does it mean to compel somebody? Do you know that word? It means that it, it takes us and it pushes us in a direction. Right? Kind of like you start this thing off by grabbing the one and then it sends it off. And when you compel somebody, it would be like, Ezra, stand up for a second. He's my boy, so I can do this. Compelling Ezra, if I were compelling Ezra, it would mean that I would move him around wherever I want him to go and that he would end up wherever I want him, right? So Jesus' love does that for you and me. He loves us, and we know that because we were baptized into his name and we were given new life in him. And then he says, go out. And touch other people with my love. Right? Does he say that to you? And he says it to me. And he says it to all of these folks out here. And what he says is that that will continue going on forever and ever and ever until he comes back. Because just like the little balls move back and forth, you might love somebody and then you might love them and then you might love them. And then eventually, the love of Jesus kind of comes back, and it touches you through other people again, and then it sends you back out to touch the lives of other people, and this thing keeps moving, right? How long has it been moving so far? Like 2,000 years, right? I mean, that's a long, long, long time. And Jesus said, if you keep loving people this way and telling them about my love, it's going to keep going All the way until the day that I come back. Has that happened yet? Has Jesus come back yet? No. Right? Even though the Cubs and the Indians are in the World Series. Right? (laughs) Jesus hasn't come back yet. Even though some people said he would. Right? So until he comes back, love other people in the name of Jesus. Love other people in the name of Jesus. Let's pray. I'll say words and you can say them after me, okay? Dear Jesus, dear Jesus, thank you for loving us. Thank you for loving us. And for sending us out and for sending us out to love others. To love others. Lord help us. Lord help us to understand your love. To understand your love and to be compelled by your love. And to be compelled by your love so that we so that we would change the world. Would change the world. In your name dear Jesus we pray. In your name, dear Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, thanks so much for coming up today. You can make your way back to your seats, okay?
sisters in the Lord, I invite you, find a Bible and then be seated. So find a Bible if you need one. Uh, there are some red ones kind of on the carts in the aisle there. <clears throat> if you don't have one of those, go ahead and use your phone. Use whatever Bible you brought with you. Um, if you're using a red one, just turn to page 967. 967 in the red one. If you brought your own, I could guess what page it's on, but I wouldn't know. Uh, you'll just have to find 2 Corinthians 8 all by yourself. So in the red Bible, page 967. In your own Bible, 2 Corinthians chapter 8. So hear this lesson for the day. We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means, of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints, and this not as we expected. But they gave themselves first to the Lord, and then by the will of God to us. Accordingly, we urged Titus that as he had started, so he should complete among you this act of grace. For as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all earnestness, and in our love for you, see that you excel in this act of grace also. So the first seven verses of 2 Corinthians 8. We pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, I ask you that you would do your work in worship, that you would pause us from whatever we have been rushing through and whatever we shall rush into in the morning, that you would quiet our hearts and our minds, that we would hear from you, that your spirit would work in us to continue shaping us into the very image of Jesus himself so that he would receive glory when we act and live and love as he does. We pray these things in his powerful name. Amen. So, Paul says in a different place, in, in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, he says, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of salvation for all who believe, first the Jew, then the Gentile. You can go ahead and put the screen up. Sorry, I got distracted and saw that it was blank. Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel, the good news, because it is the power of God for the salvation of all who believe. You know, it's Reformation Day, right? This is a day where, where we kind of, as Lutheran Christians, stand victoriously and sing with hoarse voices, a mighty fortress is our God, because this is, this is our day, right? This is the day when the gospel came to life again and poured itself out over the church. This is God's day where his word of salvation for all who believe would be made known from us to the ends of the earth. But I wonder if we know the gospel so well we've forgotten it. If we understand the message of the gospel so well that the page is so worn that we can tell the story by heart that, that maybe we've forgotten the impact that it has had on us. I had the opportunity to hang out with the third graders in their class on Thursday morning um, talking about mission work and why we do it and that kind of thing. And I said, what is the gospel? And 
nearly every kid raised their hand and said, well, that means that Jesus died and he rose again for me. Correct? Okay. Wow. Maybe we need to go back to third grade. Did Jesus die and rise again for you? Okay, great. Now we can move on. I fear that that has become such a normal story that it has lost its abnormality on us. You see, Scripture teaches us, and this is a thing from Lutheran theology that we make a big deal of, that that until we're broken by God and his law, that that little message that Jesus died and he rose again for me, really, it just doesn't mean a whole lot. So let's speak in terms of debt. How many of you have ever been in debt? How many of you maybe still are? Okay, me too, like my hand's up too. How many of you have ever paid one off? That's a cool day, right? And you like cut up that card and then throw it away and never see it again. Or you, you burn that mortgage and like sing a hymn of praise to our God, right? Like it's over. Victory is mine. So here's the thing. Here's what scripture says. This is the thing called the law. That that you and I owe God a debt. And whenever someone tells me, hey, uh, it's time to square up, right? Like maybe a buddy and I split the cost of something. Hey, it's time to square up. Okay, what do I owe? And you kind of like reach for your back pocket and you pull out the wallet like, okay, let's just do this. It's within my power. Let's figure this out. We agreed to it. God God says, okay, here's what your debt is, though. This debt that you and I earned simply by being broken because we live in part of a broken world. See, this thing called sin is much bigger than those things that we might confess to our God or to our spouse. Those things that we have done wrong or not done right. Right? Sin has more to do with your being than it has to do with your action. Your actions are just kind of the symptom of the the being, right? You act the way you are. And scripture tells us that we were conceived and born into sin and that the wages of sin is death. So when you ask God, okay, let's square up. What am I supposed to do here? He says, okay, you owe me your life. Not just your life, but the life of your kids. Not just their lives, but the life of your spouse. Not just their lives, but the lives of everyone that you've ever known. Not just their lives, but the lives of every person who right now across the globe is drawing breath. And it still doesn't cover it. See, when you, when you experience the law as God writes it in his word, you very quickly arrive at a very terrifying place because you realize quite quickly the magnitude of the hole that you're in. And you realize very quickly that there's really nothing that you can do To dig your way out. Only when you're there will the gospel actually be good news. Only when you realize the magnitude of your sinfulness. Only when you realize, as St. Peter says in Acts chapter 2, that you were the ones who nailed Jesus to the cross and watched him die. Only when you're there will it make any difference at all that he did it for you. Because Jesus, in that moment, on that cross, became your sin. It wasn't enough 
that he would take all of your misdeeds and sign the dotted line saying, I did all of these things and shall pay the consequence for them. Because it's not just your misdeeds, it is your very being that is sinful. He became your sin. He took your being on himself. So that when the psalmist would write in Psalm 22, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? How come you don't hear me when I cry out to you? Why do you turn your back on me? I'm crying for help all the day long, and I stay up all night crying out to you, and it's like you're deaf. You just don't hear me. That when the psalmist wrote those words... Jesus would be the only person for whom they were true. Because on that cross, he became you. And on that cross, he became forsaken. Had his back turned on him by by God the Father. Was left completely alone. Where you feel. He was left completely alone so that you would know that you aren't. Died. Like literally stopped breathing, a heart stopped beating. Died. Buried in a grave like you and I one day will be. Descended into hell like you and I will never ever have to be. So that you can know that he loves you and that you are made alive in him. Because Jesus did not stay dead. Jesus rose again from the dead for you. And he has given you the same Holy Spirit that brought him to life on Easter morning. In the waters of your baptism, his Holy Spirit becomes part of you. So that he would live and breathe in you. So that one day, whenever it is that you do fall into a grave and rest there in the ground, you would do so with the promise that he will even raise you from the dead. And that until that day, you don't walk alone. Until that day, you are filled by his spirit, compelling you by his love to make a real difference in this world. To be his instrument for proclaiming the gospel that he died and rose again for you. It is only when we get to that low place that we can experience the sweetness of the gospel. And know that it was for me and how life-changing it is for me and how life-changing it is for you. That is what got the Macedonian churches right by the heart. Paul says, I want you to know, dear church in Corinth, about these churches in Macedonia. You see, what was going on at this period in history, the church in Jerusalem was under great persecution where there were widows and orphans out on the street. They frankly didn't have enough. And so those who were traveling the churches and had, were planting the churches, Paul and others said, hey, let's just take up an offering so that we can support our brothers and sisters over here that are going through a really, really hard time. And almost out of a matter of obligation, they asked the churches in Macedonia. Word got out to them too, just so they weren't left out. And Paul says that they didn't really expect much from them, because the churches in Macedonia were themselves being persecuted, and were themselves not wealthy. Paul is writing to the Corinthian church. Corinth was a very, very rich place. It was a very major trade hub. Anyone who was anybody retired there. Because it was right on the sea, and it was a perfect environment, and it was just a cool place to be. So the Corinthian church had a lot of money and a lot of means. And Paul is saying, here's what I want you to know. Your brothers and sisters over here, yeah, they're hurting. You already know that. But even beyond that, I want you to know what God is doing over here in Macedonia. 
they have been compelled by the love of Christ so that they begged us even though we didn't think they had anything. Even though it was true that they really don't have much. Paul says they gave even beyond their means and they, and they begged to be a part of what was going on so that they could be the tangible means by which Jesus changed the world. So that they could be the literal daily bread of their brothers and sisters who they were never probably going to meet because they lived thousands of miles away. So that when they prayed, Lord, provide for your people, they understood that it was them, that they were the ones by whom that was going to happen. They said, Lord, just let us be part of this. Use us. And as they were looking around, Paul shows up and says, hey, there's this opportunity for you. And they gave generously. They didn't keep it to themselves. Now, this impact that was had on them echoed, right? In two ways, at least, that we know about. The first one was that they fed the hungry people. Is that a good thing? Is it a good thing to feed hungry people? Okay. So don't forget your check for 25 bucks, right? It's a good thing to feed hungry people. But what's even better? They were inspiring other people, other Christians, to see Jesus at work in their lives. And to know, like, hey, if they're doing this, we probably can too. Like, we know their story. We know where they're at. We know that they, they're not as well off as us. We have way more gifts than them. Let's give our gifts too. And that was actually what happened in Corinth. And Paul said, that's why we're doing this thing. Not to compel you, not to like make you feel forced into anything, but just to let you know, here's what other brothers and sisters are doing. And so the impact of Christ's love continued through their church and swept over them so that they were part of this gift too. Now, here's another example. How many of you have heard of Abraham? Right? And you sang the silly song, maybe even on a mission trip. Right, like Father Abraham, and pretty soon you're dancing around like you're crazy, right? God says to Abraham, he was the first guy that, that God chose and sent out on mission. Genesis chapter 12, way back at the beginning of things, God chooses Abram, and he says, I'm going to bless you, and I'm going to make you a father of many nations, so that you're going to have so many descendants that you can't even count them. And he says, if you want to believe me, just look up at the stars in the night sky, like out in the country where there's no light. This makes a whole lot more sense, right? Look at the stars in the night sky. You, you can't begin to count them. That's how many your descendants will be. And I'm going to make you into a great nation and bless you in an overwhelming way so that by you... All the peoples will be blessed. God didn't just bless Abraham to bless Abraham so that Abraham could go, Hey man, God blessed me and I now trust God. He blessed Abraham so that it would overflow from Abraham. And just like one of those little metal balls on a Newton's cradle would just keep passing the thing on and passing the thing on and passing the thing on until thousands of years later, here we are because God led Abraham to trust in him and to be a blessing with his word and with his love. So there's another name, Martin Luther. How many of you know that name? How many of you saw red when you came in today and thought, oh yeah, it's Reformation Day. And you're like, it took him 11 minutes to get to Martin Luther on Reformation Day. So 499 years ago, there was an Augustinian monk, right? A guy who gave his life over to the study of Scripture and to the helping of God's people. And this Augustinian monk named Martin Luther was horrified by God. He was terrified of him. He saw his sin and he understood through his reading of scripture that he could never actually get rid of it. 
that no matter how hard he tried, he could never actually be sure when he looked at Jesus if he saw his judge or if he saw his savior. He lived his life wondering if this salvation that he proclaimed was actually for him at all. Have you ever been there? <laughs> like, like I, I've been there. And there was this thing going on that started back a few years before Martin was around and Martin was a monk. And it was this thing where they, the Catholic Church was using a Latin text. Like if you grew up Catholic, you might understand this. They were using a Latin Bible. And there was this movement in scholarship. And remember, he was Dr. Martin Luther. He was a scholar and a university professor at the university in Wittenberg, Germany, right? And so they started discovering Greek texts, which was the original way the New Testament was written down. And they were able to start looking at those. And one day, he was reading Galatians. And he saw that the word for repent didn't mean beat yourself up trying to get rid of your sin and to show how sorry you were. So that you would eventually maybe be able to, to kind of like assuage God's wrath by showing how sorry you were for how horrible you are. But that the word for repent meant watch the Holy Spirit change your heart and mind. For this monk named Martin, this was life changing. Because he for the very first time understood that Jesus, who died and who rose again, did so for him, for this monk named Martin, so that he would not have to be terrified of God, so that he would understand that when he saw Jesus on his throne, that he was not looking at his judge and executioner, but the very one who saved him from death and hell itself. He did not keep it to himself. Remember, he was Dr. Luther, and so he was a professor, and so he did what was the normal thing to do. He wrote some debate theses about what this gospel means in the lives of people, and he stuck them on what was at the time a bulletin board, saying, other professors, let's talk about this in a public debate. The way the Reformation started was because of some rowdy college kids. I'm serious. They took it. Without him knowing about it, they took it off the door and they went and they took it to the printing press, which had just been invented a little while ago. And they made like hundreds and hundreds of copies of it and said, here's what our doctor is talking about. And all of a sudden, the Reformation happened. And here we are as people who hold on to this gospel message above all other things because it is the power of God for the salvation of all who believe. You know what I pray? My, my prayer as I read about the Macedonians and as I meditate upon Dr. Luther and what he has done for us and what he has done for the church and, and countless individuals who have heard the gospel clearly articulated, my prayer is that the way I use my resources the way that I view all of those things that God has given me, whether it's my time, or whether it's my money, or whether it's my marriage, or whether it's my sons. That the way that I live my life generously would leave a legacy. A legacy not, not for me, right? Because one day, people are going to forget that Christian would ever live. I'm totally cool with that. Some of you might have already forgotten, right? But my prayer is that long after I'm dead and buried and gone, because of the way that I have lived with my sons and with my wife and with my money and with my time and with everything the Lord has given me, that long after I'm dead and gone, people will still proclaim the name of Jesus Christ. See, that's why the Macedonians did what they did. It wasn't because they felt like they had enough. It wasn't because they felt... Like they were forced into anything. They said, 
we want people to know that Jesus is real. We want people to know that Jesus is real. And so we're going to give this gift. Notice we don't have any of their names written down. Notice it was several congregations together, and no one remembers their names. No one remembers who the, the guy who gave the most or the guy who gave the least. All that we remember is that because of them, Jesus became real for some people in Jerusalem. So what about us? It says of the Macedonians, Paul says this, he says, First, they gave themselves to the Lord. They said to their God, use us. You have bought us and you have claimed us as your own. Use us. Us, what a privilege it would be that God would use one like me, flawed as I am, to see the name of Jesus proclaimed. And then, Paul says, they gave themselves to us, to this task. As they were looking around for the opportunity, Paul shows up and says, here's an opportunity. And they gave all of themselves. For you and I, there's this opportunity, right? Right? I mean, there's no getting around it. We're going to talk about it. There's this opportunity that on the one hand is going to change the way that we are able to worship. More people hearing the name of Jesus proclaimed. More people receiving his sacrament. More people going out into their community as equipped, as equipped as missionaries in their everyday life. That's a good thing. That's something worth giving towards. That's part of a legacy. Enough classrooms for 650 kids. That's dozens more families than we're able to serve now. And long after we're dead and gone, they're going to be the ones sitting here. They're going to be the ones preaching. They're going to be the ones as leaders in their community, letting people know that Jesus is real. What about training missionaries in our own city that know people that you're never, ever going to know, that you would never be able to relate to because of where you happen to live, the language you happen to speak, the color of your skin, all of the barriers that are there. What if, through Link, we could actually raise up missionaries in our own city? What would the city of Milwaukee look like if Jesus were real there? If Jesus were active there through his people? Dear friends, I don't know about you, but that sounds like an opportunity to me. That for those of us that say, dear Lord, use us, it's like he just flapped this thing in our lap and said, well, here you go. Dear friends, my prayer for us is that we would go together in this thing, trusting our God to provide, even like the Macedonians did, that we wouldn't keep this gospel message to ourselves, just like Martin Luther didn't, so that long after we're gone, long after we're just dust in the ground, people would still know the name of Jesus. We pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank you for your Holy Spirit. We ask you that he would continue to move in us, that he would continue to shape and mold us, so that when people look at us, they would see your Son, Jesus. So that when people hear of him, they would know his love is real because they have felt it from us, his people. Lord, I ask you, that you would bless these tithes and offerings that are about to be collected, that you would use them to make an impact in the world, that your name would be glorified, and that your people would proclaim you. We pray these things in your name, dear Jesus. Amen. Amen. Now the ushers will collect the tithes and the offerings for the day.
My prayer for each and every one of us is that God would work a miracle in our lives the way that he did the Macedonian Christians. That we would be inspired by his great grace for each one of us to give ourselves first to the Lord. First to the Lord. And then when we ask the question, well, how do I do that? How do I give myself first to the Lord? Then he would open you up to the opportunity that he gave, that he gives. He gave them an opportunity to give to widows and orphans in Jerusalem, people that they would never meet. For most of them, that was irrelevant. It was an opportunity to give themselves to the Lord by doing something tangible that would make an impact upon the world for Christ and his love. My hope and my prayer is that every person at Hales Corners Lutheran Church, every family, would get on their knees before God and simply ask the question, Lord, what do you want me to do with the opportunity that you give? See, here in the video that I want you to see, he gives you an opportunity to respond first to the Lord and then to the need that we have for the sake of the ministry that's making a difference in thousands and thousands of people's lives. So as you look at this video, pray. That not only the 20% who always prop up the whole work of the ministry, we need you 20% to give your very, very best to this, but also the 80% who maybe have never given of themselves to give yourself first to the Lord in response to the way he has given himself to you, and then to this opportunity that he gives you as a tangible way to give yourself to him. So, what a miracle it would be if 100% of the people of God at Hales Corners Lutheran Church got on their knees before God and said, in response to your great love for me, what do you want me to do with this opportunity? And however it is that the Holy Spirit inspires that response in you, what a miracle it would be in the family of God. So this opportunity and this video, pray as you hear what is said.
So before you leave today, my hope and prayer is that you'll take two things with you. In the, uh, on the impact table in the back is a, is a devotional guide. And at, at each exit, there is a brochure about the capital campaign. Make sure and pick both things up. In our prayers this morning, we have these prayer requests from our prayer book. Um, a prayer for um, Uncle Larry, who joined our Lord in heaven on Wednesday. We pray for all of those who grieve the fact that he's gone on before them. A prayer of healing for uh, this person's brother-in-law who is hospitalized with an ailment. Uh, this person says, thank you for all of the blessings placed in, in my life. A prayer for continued growth in a relationship together. A prayer for Israel and the United States. A prayer for an older brother who is getting a bone marrow transplant for leukemia. And a younger brother who is getting a stem cell transplant for a brain tumor. My goodness. A prayer for strength and healing for all troubled marriages. A prayer for a husband to find a job. And a prayer for Oma Bev and Grandma Sarah Jane, who are both fighting cancer. With all these prayer requests and the things that are going on in your own head, heart, and life, we stand and we pray before the Lord. Dear Lord God, Heavenly Father, continue what you began from the moment of the fall to reform heads, hearts, lives, and minds and to draw them to the cross and the empty tomb. Continue to reform your church and draw us to you on our knees in response to your great grace. Use us inspire us the way you did the Macedonians to impact the world. And so whether or not we are caught in the grip of grief, or whether or not we are bent low by sickness or disease, or whether or not we are paralyzed by transition and change and fear as we look at the world around us, stand up your church in boldness and courage and strength, knowing that in the midst of whatever it is that we face, one little word can fell him. Christ. Oh, dear Christ, inspire your church, exercise, exercise our faith, and teach us that you are Lord, for it is you to whom we pray as you have taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen.